I'll just when they call kids up, we'll just head out now. And we'll see what we have.
Ja, ja, ja.
this candle for joy. To those who live as exiles from home in a dark time, to those enslaved as exiles due to others' oppression, to those who are sins exiles from their best God upon themselves, the Lord speaks the joy of good news. A reading from Zephaniah 3, verses 14 to 20. Sing aloud, O daughter, daughter Zion, shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. A warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over your gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here today, whether you're in person or online. We always want to have a strong welcome to all of you. If this is your first time with us, if you'd like to, in the pews before you, fill out that card, connection wise. Put it back there in the box so we can get to know you a little bit better. And as always, we do have coffee and donuts. Can you hear me okay? So many of you know that I didn't have COVID last week. I have tested twice. I don't have to wear this mask, but out of respect for all of you holidays, I just want to be cautious and careful. So please know that is why I look strange. But I do care about you. Leo, as I said, I'm wearing this for you too because I care about you. So. This is a very exciting day. Uh, we have a lot of things that are going on. We do have children's programming today, and I think like right before the Baptist, we're going to have the children dismissed after talking to Jamie, just to make sure, so just so you know, we're going to have that opportunity to do that. But today we have some special things in China that are actually going to be taking place, playing some of our favorite carols and songs. All these individuals who are here have spent their time, effort, dedication, and they've been on the worship team. Had a long marathon Sundays, so coming at 8:15, then worship, then down downstairs with their family and friends, and coming back up for practice. So for all of our hard work and dedication, can you give them a round of applause? <laughs> We're going to start off today with you talking about O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And I want to read just very quickly a short story. We've been talking about this book that again, Carl Rombaro. Stories Behind the Best Love Song by East Collins. Today I just want to read a little bit about the Como Como Emmanuel. Many of you may not know that this is one of the oldest carols that we know as far as Christian in existence and also inception. The writer of the Como Como Emmanuel is unknown, but was no doubt a monk or priest who penned the words before 800 AD. He was also a scholar with rich knowledge of both the Old and New Testaments. Once completed to him was evidently picked up by many European churches and monasteries and became an intensely important part of the church. Yet for 51 weeks of the year, he was endured, save for a sixth week of Advent leading up to the birth of Christ. The reason why we can give the acceptance of this song to the Christian church has to do with a person by the name of John Mason. Neil. Born on January 24, 1818, this Anglian priest was educated at Trinity College in Cambridge. Brilliant, a man who would write and speak more than 20 languages. He should have been destined for greatness, yet many feared that his intelligence and insight at the time might overshadow some of the aspects that he was made to do within his life and ministry. When he was a minister to those who could truly be called the least of these, the often frail recipient Neil reviewed every facet of scripture and scripture-based writing he could find. And it was during these studies that he came across the Latin chant, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, in a book called Solatorium Canatonium Capnaquera. Seizing on the importance of the song's inspired text, Neil translated the words into English. And interesting in his initial work, the lyrics began, Draw nigh, draw nigh, Emmanuel. Today, instead of singing, you're going to have the 
opportunity to hear this in Chinese form. So we think about Christ coming. He is coming. He has come. But as we look at the calendar, it's worth this time of Advent, waiting for him to come. Let this song begin a little mini story for you as we play and sing. First, coming about the coming of Christ. O come, O come, O come.
to live an exemplary life for your child. And if so, please say we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. Do you commit yourselves to pray with and for your child? Do you commit to teach this child that she may be led to profess Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior? If so, please say we do with the help of God. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness the work and word of Jesus Christ as best you are able? If so, please say that we will with the help of God. Do you promise, according to the grace given to you, to grow with the child in the Christian faith, to help this child to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ by celebrating Christ's presence? by furthering Christ's mission to all the world, and by offering the nurture of the Christian church so that she may affirm her baptism. If so, please say, may do with the help of God. In Redeemer, do you as people of Redeemer Church, as members of the body of Christ, promise your love, prayers, support, and care for Josie as she grows in her faith, discovers, and exercises her gifts, and seeks to follow in Christ's ways. We promise to love, prayer, support, and care for Josie. It is our aim to partner with her in the Christian of our to the end that we may know Jesus as Savior and love Christ's love. Let us now affirm our faith together through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father of all. We do have gifts for Rachel Jacob. We have flowers. 
Sunday, so 4 p.m. here at the church. Next, I mean. And then following, I want to remind you, coming up in the new year, 2024, Redeemer Trivia, which is taking place on February 24th. Uh, please know that you can reach out to the wire line to know Diane and others uh, will be able to help you with that. I do want to let you know something as well. I'm going to share this my phone. Jeff just wanted to give us a quick report about what we were able to do to help Gators get in the gateway. Basically, he said, here's some things that we were able to provide. We provided sweatshirts and sweatpants, over 30 hats, two pairs of slippers, eight hats and glove sets, 50 pairs of socks, 70 pairs of gloves, and 14 food items. And then around $250 in gift cards uh, that we were able to capture. So I think that's just a wonderful way to continue to partnership. I want to give you a round of applause for your Sometimes you're going to be able to make the best decision. So it's a good reminder. 
reminder to be safe and be careful. It's okay to use the bathroom. It's okay to, to get some gas and do some smart things too. So, yes, always a reminder. Anybody else? Jeff. A little birdie told me it's your birthday tomorrow. What? I didn't hear that. I am thankful for living up today and have to be alive. So, I mean that sense of Thank you. Do you notice how quickly I transitioned? Anybody else? Anybody else? No, it's fine. Thank you. Well, I, I gave the challenge last week. I hope that you did take some time to think about a prayer in your week. You know, prayer requests or phrases to be thinking about this week. Do the same thing this week. Just, just be mindful. In our world, we often become so self-focused. My needs, my thinking, my wants, my desire. And the truth is, there is a whole world that is around us that has all kinds of challenges, wars, and, and health issues, and just trying to make it another day. Let's not forget, not just during the season, but also beyond, to think about the needs of others. So as we go to the Lord's Prayer, maybe just silently pray in our heart for one of these needs that are being mentioned today. And we'll continue to follow in this service. God, we're thankful as we can celebrate good things. Babies being born, uh, donations to help our community, and building a further connection and partnership with the school. Uh, we're thankful for those that have made it already back from, uh, as they're winding down their undergraduate academic career and thinking about things for the future. We're thankful for those who are able to return home safely from, from travel. We're thankful for even individuals that are progressing in their health, that they can do better and even attend church. Those are not small or insignificant things. For births and birthdays, we give you all the praise. But for those who continue to experience challenges, for those that are still trapped, for those that at this time where school is going on and finals, it can be overwhelming, it can be overburdensome, so we pray for peace and solace and, and just safety. And also just help us to think about this world. Not just to be indifferent and to turn a blind eye or to shun, but our community, our city, our region, our, our state, nation, and world, we all need you to intervene and we need to trust you. So thank you for allowing us to continue to celebrate Christ's birth as we are here together and gathered today. We love you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to ask those that are playing chimes to make their way back up. I'm going to give you a little bit of preemptive things uh, before we actually do this song. We're going to play this two, three times. The first time, we are just going to play by ourselves. The verses two and three, I would like you to sing with us as we play. And so just as a demonstration, I will be facing towards them, helpful you, to remind us of what we sing. I'm going to allow you to continue to be seated, to be comfortable, as we have all these things going on in our service today. But let me recap it one more time. We're going to play three times through. First time, do not sing. <laughs> Verses two and three. I will give you the cue. Any questions? I've probably forgotten something today, but we're going to do our best. We're going to persevere on.
past few weeks, giving up some of the donut time and coffee time to come up and practice. We appreciate it. It's a blessing to us today. Uh, if you want to take out your Bibles, whether that's the paper form or your electronic version, then turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the, the major prophets of the Old Testament. And we are currently uh, celebrating Advent, right? We are preparing our hearts to celebrate at Christmas. During our liturgical calendar, our church calendar, we basically have two times of the year that we really prepare our hearts to celebrate uh, specific holidays. One, uh, we take 40 days prior to Easter, and that's called Lent. And here, uh, four weeks prior, so roughly 30 days, we'll give that. Uh, it's not always as exact as Lent, but we take that time of Advent four weeks prior to Christmas to prepare our hearts for the birth of Jesus, for Jesus' birthday. And who can believe that next week is Christmas? So husbands, if you haven't been on the ball, you have one week left. You have one week left, right? And so uh, next Saturday, uh, as I'm sure Jacob mentioned, uh, we are going to our next Sunday, sorry, Sunday we're going to have two services. We're going to have a 9 o'clock, a regular service, to finish our, our Advent candles. We've got one candle left to, to light for the Christ candle, so we'll have that service at 9. And then next uh, Sunday evening at 4, we're going to have our Christmas Eve, our traditional Christmas Eve, where we're going to light the candles and sing Silent Night and all that, prepare for Christmas. But as we are approaching, Advent is a time that reminds us of the darkness, the darkness uh, prior to when Jesus came. There were 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament where God was silent. There, there wasn't uh, God giving direction to, in his word. And so during this time of Advent, we are heading towards the light. That's why every week we light a new candle, because it's getting brighter and brighter as the closer we get to Christ. And so, oftentimes during this Christmas season, not just Advent, but during Christmas, it can be a very busy time of the year. We have uh, shopping to do, and whether you go back to those things called malls, where you actually have to go into a store, park in a parking lot, uh, deal with uh, long lines, or whether you go online, you have to wait for things to arrive, and because of the season, the not everything's arriving when it's supposed to. We have Christmas parties for work. We have family functions. So there is a lot going on. But with everything going on, it can be very distracting to take our hearts and minds away from what we're actually celebrating, what we're actually doing at Christmas, and that is celebrating the birth of Jesus, that Jesus came in the flesh, that he came Emmanuel, he came incarnate, he took on flesh to understand what it, what it looks like to... to to take on pain, to take on suffering, to experience friendship and joy and peace, but also uh, pain and suffering. And so, uh, and I love our Christmas songs, but sometimes when some of these songs say that Jesus wasn't crying, I don't know if I'm buying it. <laughs> and so, uh, so here, what we remind are reminded of during our Christmas season is that Jesus came in flesh. And this year, what we're doing specifically is we're looking at the four uh, servant songs in Isaiah. They're typically passages that we look at at Easter, when we're looking at Good Friday, when Jesus dies for us, to understand the suffering that Jesus did. And so this way is a way for us, again, to focus in, to put those blinders on, uh, so when we see Jesus, we can worship him uh, with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul, and all of our strength. And we do that through our traditional uh, themes of hope, peace, joy, and love. And this week, again, is on joy. So if you would, follow along with me in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. It says this, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says, thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it who gives breath to the people on it and the spirit to those who walk in it. 
I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeons, and from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. This is the reading of God's word this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your grace, Father, for uh, your faithfulness, Father, that you bring us to yourself, that you have chosen us, that you have called us to your righteousness, uh, even as children like Joseph. Father, I just thank you for what you're doing in and through this congregation, and Father, I thank each of us. So this morning, as we hear your word, as we hear from your spirit, Father, I pray that you would help us, give us ears to hear you, and Father, that we would all leave change today. Father, that we would all be people of joy. And so, Father, I pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. So, so like last week, our summary statement for this week to help us to understand what's going on in this passage of Isaiah is this. Rejoice! Our God created everything. God delights in his servant who is gentle enough not to even bruise a reed. He will establish justice in the whole earth, and he calls us to his righteousness, and he will not be discouraged. Let me say that one more time. Rejoice! Our God created everything, and God delights in his servant, who is gentle enough not to bruise a reed. He will establish justice in the whole earth, and he calls us to his righteousness, and he will not be discouraged. I love how this verse starts. I don't know if you remember this show back, and this was from some of you. I know you didn't because you weren't even born then. But it's a show called The A-Team. I don't know if you remember. It had a big black band with a, a red spoiler. I don't know why they had a spoiler on this band. Um, they had a group of mercenaries that used to be in the armed forces. And uh, had Mr. T as, uh, um, I can't even remember his name offhand, but... Who was it? B.A. Baracus. Thank you. Yes, I remembered it earlier. B.A. Baracus was his name. And uh, the leader of the crew was named uh, uh, Hannibal. And his, uh, he always had a, a catchphrase. And I love it when a good plan comes together. And that's kind of what we're talking about here in this passage. Because here, what we have is that God has a plan. He has created all things. And we see that in this passage. He has created the earth. He has stretched it out. He has a plan on salvation, and that is through his servant that we have been reading about. And so here in verse 42, 1, the first half, it says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. And what's beautiful, I love that idea, in whom my soul delights. I don't know if there's a better way to, to describe what joy is, in whom my soul delights. Have you ever experienced that soul-delighting uh, moment? I don't know what it is for you, but typically, typically, and it's not just the time of year, if I think of joy, if I think of my soul-delighting, where I usually am, it's around Christmas time. It's around seeing a Christmas tree fully lit up, just like the beautiful ones behind me, full of Christmas presents under the tree, whenever snow is outside, and the snow has just fallen, and it's all quiet. I don't know why, but that is where what I think of with my soul delights. And here, what we see is that God is describing his servant in whom his soul delights, meaning that he is, he is enacting God's plan perfectly, that he is the perfect servant, that he is the perfect person, that he is enacting everything that God has. He has a good plan, and he loves it when it comes together, and it's going to come together through his son that he has chosen. Now, for some of you that are hearing this, maybe it sounds familiar because we see this happen in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 3, verses uh, 13 through 17, it says this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. There's that word righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and 
and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, the voice came from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom his soul delights. And so we see that in the baptism of Jesus, and here we see this years, uh, centuries earlier in the book of Isaiah, that this, this passage is describing um, for the people that are in captivity to give them all hope during, for their consolation while they're waiting uh, to be rescued, but also it's looking forward to Jesus when Jesus comes. And so here we see that Jesus is the servant in whom God is well pleased. That in whom God delights, that God has chosen, that He is part of His plan. But what's fascinating in this passage, what we see is we see what is Jesus' plan? What is Jesus coming to do here on earth? And what we see three different times in this passage is what is He bringing forth? What is He establishing? Justice. We see that in three parts. We see that in uh, the second half of the first verse. One B, it says, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations, which is significant. We also see in verse 3, he will faithfully bring forth justice. And in 4, four uh, second half, verse 4, it says, till he has established justice on the earth. So what have I said? Whenever we see something repeated, what should we do? We should take notice. That God wants us to get through our thick skulls a particular point. And hear what is the point that he wants us to, to hear. That God is establishing justice through his servant, through Jesus. He's establishing justice. Where? Is this just for the Jewish people? Is this just for the, those that are in captivity? Is he just going to bring them home and then is he going to call it a day? No, he's not. He's establishing justice for all the nations, for all the Jews. But not only all the Jews, but also for us, the Gentiles. Those who are not of Jewish heritage. This is good news, not just for Jewish people, but for us. Because we see the suffering servant, the servant of Jesus, or the servant of God, that Jesus the Messiah is going to come back, and he is going to establish justice for all of us. Which is good news. Which should bring us joy. That everyone that has been wrong, every wrong will be made right. And he will not rest until justice has been served. And that is good news for us, but those of us who have experienced injustice, those of, who have uh, experienced oppression, abuse, it should give us solace, it should give us hope that Jesus is not done, and he will bring justice to each of us. Now, what kind of servant is he? Now, for the Jewish people, and I've talked about this before, what, what the Jewish people, they thought the Messiah was going to come back, and he was going to start a, a revolution that the revolution that he was going to do for Jesus whenever he came back uh, was going to kick out the Romans, that he was going to bring peace and bring uh, uh, sovereignty back to the Jewish people, that, that the Messiah was going to be, the Jewish people believe, the most bloodiest uh, leader in the world. But that's not what we see. And even in Isaiah, here in this uh, passage in verse 42, it says that he is going to be a gentle uh, Messiah, a, a, a person that's not looking for attention. And we see that in verses 2 and 3. It says, He will not cry aloud, nor lift up his voice, or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wig he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. So what's happening here? Well, two things we see is that when Jesus goes into the street, he's not asking to draw attention just to himself. He is not making it about himself to bring himself power, to bring himself influence, which is the way of the world, because Jesus' way, as we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount, isn't the way of the world. It's of his own values, of his own design. And here, what we see is that when Jesus goes in and he does healing, whenever he, he helps people, oftentimes, especially in the book of Mark, what we see is that, what does he say? He says, don't go and tell anybody, because it's not my time yet. And so here, what we're seeing is that Jesus is not making it about himself or about power or about influence. He's making it about God and glorifying God through his words, but he's not doing it in an abrasive way. We also see in verse 3, it says, A bruised reed he will not break, or a faintly burning wick he will not quench. So what we see here is that whenever you're walking through a field and you see a reed, a uh, stalk of something, if you break it, it's destroyed. But Jesus, it, there will be a bruised reed, he will suffer, he will, he will endure pain and suffering. 
but he will not break. And the same thing, what we see is that it will not be quenched. So even though whatever we're experiencing, and remember for these people that are experiencing it, they have been taken out of, out of uh, they were taken out of Jerusalem, and they were taken to Babylon, and eventually uh, the Assyrians king Cyrus is going to come in and save them from Babylon, although they'll still be oppressed for a little while. What we see is that they are waiting to be saved, just like us. It's already, but not, not yet. Even as Jacob was talking about, is that in Advent, we have... Jesus has already come, he has already conquered, he has already died for our sins, but yet, it's already, but not yet. Jesus has not come the second time, he has not uh, restored all of his justice, and so we are still waiting, and so he is, he is uh, our hope will not be quenched, uh, that Jesus will bring forth justice. And so here, what we see in verse 4 is that with Jesus' work, even with his establishing justice, he is not going to be discouraged. Verse 4, it says, He will not grow faint, or will he be discouraged, till he has established justice on the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. So Jesus, as we see at Good Friday, as we understand that as he's captured and beaten for us, even though that he has all these things, we see even the night before Jesus goes to the cross, what happens? He goes to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And what happens? He is stressed. He is praying to God, asking him to take his cup from him, right? Remember in that scene, he is bleeding blood, or his sweat is, 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 is turning into blood. And so and that is a medical condition that if you can get so stressed that out of your pores comes blood, that's how stressed Jesus was. He was wanting this cup taken from him, but he knew what his mission was. What was his mission? To enact justice, to bring forth justice to God, to be able to pay for our sins. And he, he was not going to be discouraged. He was going to stay focused on that. So even though God said, no, this is the way, this is my plan, it has to happen. Jesus stayed focused. He was not discouraged, even though that he endured uh, pain, even though he endured hardship. But we also see in verse 5, what brings Jesus hope? What brings the servant hope? We hear God. This is God uh, speaking here. Verse 5. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out? Who spread out the earth and what comes from it? Who gives breath to the people on it and the spirit to those who walk in it? So here, in verse 5, God, in case we've forgotten who God is and what he has done, he is establishing his sovereignty yet again. We see that God has created all things, just like in Genesis chapter 1, right? That here the prophet Isaiah is reiterating what we know, and we know that God has created the heavens, and he stretched them out. We have the heavens, and we also have the earth. He spread out the earth and what comes from it. Who gives us the breath in our bodies? God does. Right? And the spirit to those who walk in it. So here, as we see that the... the that the servant will not be discouraged, discouraged, even as we see that whenever we need encouragement, whenever we may need to not be discouraged, what do we do? We go back to God's word and remember who he is, we remember his faithfulness, we remember his promises, we remember, remember what he has done, we remember that he gives us our breath and our bodies, that he created all things, that he has a plan, that God is faithful. And not only is God faithful, but he has called you Okay, and I love these verses, verses 6 and 7. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness, I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nation, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prisons who sit in darkness. Did you catch that? Did you catch the language there? Who does the work? Who does the heavy lifting? Do you? No! God does! Did you catch it? I am the Lord. I have called you, called you to be part of this family. In righteousness, I will take you by the hand, and I will keep you. I will give you a covenant for the people, a life for the nation. Isn't that beautiful? It's not up to you. God is doing the work. Who has had a stressful week? Okay? Yeah, everybody can raise your hand. Y'all are going through something. And so how beautiful of a passage is this? That God is relational enough. He knows you enough. He is taking you by the hand. 
just like a good dad does. Just as Jacob, I'm sure, does with Josie, and will continue as she takes those first steps. He's going to take her by the hand, right? And so God is doing that with us. Whatever you're going through right now, and I know a lot of stuff, you're thinking, I know you're thinking about football later, I know you're thinking about other cookies that need to be made, I know that there's other things in your mind. It's okay, uh, there's grace here for everyone. But whatever you're stressed about, that God is here with you, that God knows the servant, that God loves you, and he has chosen you. That he is opening our eyes to the blind and bringing out the prisoners from the dungeon. That is our blindness to our sin and our oppression through sin. God is doing that work. And finally, in verses 8 and 9, it says, I am the Lord God. <clears throat> that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carve idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Therefore, they spring forth when I tell you them. What I have here in my notes is just, this is signed by God. So as we're going through this passage, understanding who the servant is, who the Messiah is going to be, what we see in these final two uh, verses here in verse 8 and 9, is that this is signed by God. God is just like John Hancock, signing it super big so we can all see that he is the Lord, that is his name, and my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to uh, carved idols. Now, so what that, what that means is that we are currently in the midst of brokenness still. That as we're in Advent, all the candles aren't lit. We're still waiting for Jesus to come and to restore all things to himself. But as I was preparing, as I was reading, uh, I was reminded of uh, the C.S. Lewis books, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is his first book. And in that book, you know, Narnia is an imaginary country ruled by a usurper queen called the White Witch. Uh, for the words of one character, she has made an enchantment, or she has cast a spell over the whole country, so that it is always winter here, and what? Never Christmas. What an awful thought. But Aslan, the great lion, the true king of Narnia, who represents Jesus, comes to rescue and fulfills an old rhyme in that winter land. It says, wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. The sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets his death. And when he shakes his mane, we will have spring again. And of course, as that is a representation of Jesus. And so as we get closer to uh, the time of Christmas, my hope is that we, we see Jesus a little bit more clearly. We see him coming as a baby. And then he grows and takes on a perfect life that we should have lived. And then he dies at death. And as he takes on our, as he dies at death, after that perfect life, he defeats death. He takes on our sin. And he pays the price for us. That is the way that part of God's plan, and that is what he is doing to serve God, to serve us, to love us. So we have to ask the question: what does this mean for us? What does this mean for you, whether you're here in person or at home? I hope you hear this. That God delights in you. That God has called you. He has called you for righteousness and justice. And we need to remember that God has created the world, that he is bringing, uh, bringing redemption and restoration to the world, and that you have been called to be his servant to bring the good news of Jesus wherever we go. So God is calling you to bring hope, peace, joy, and love wherever you go, especially this Christmas season. So whenever you go over to the Galleria and try to find a parking spot or rent the promenade, God help you. <laughs> whenever you try to order online and things are running out or it's delayed and you have to call customer service and say, where's my package? Whenever you're driving on 64 and people are, are running and driving like mad people, I'll, I'll use kind words, how can you show peace, hope, patience, and love wherever you go? Whenever you're at that family meal, and I know you guys are going to have family meals. We've got a lot of family this week and next week. We've got a lot of time with each other. How can you show peace, joy, love, and hope to those in your family? Because God is calling you to be a servant, just like Jesus. Calling you to bring forth justice, to bring hope, peace, joy, and love. 
and let's be people of joy. Let's have a little fun for Christmas and show the joy we have because of what Jesus has done. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. Father, we're so thankful. We're so thankful for your servant, Jesus. Father, we rejoice that you created everything. Father, that you delight in your servant, who is gentle enough not to bruise a reed. Father, we're so thankful that you are established, established justice in the whole earth for Jews and Gentiles. Father, we're so thankful that you call us to your righteousness. And we're so thankful that Jesus was not discouraged, that he stayed on a task, that he stayed with his mission to live the perfect life for us, that he died a death we deserve so that we can experience your goodness and the joy of your paradise together. Father, we pray your blessing as we go forth, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. We hope that you've enjoyed the mini presentation of the Shirt about Jesus is coming today. We started off with a couple of Emmanuel, he is coming. Then we shared the perspective of Mary with breath of heaven. What is it like to carry in your womb the Savior of the whole of the whole world? Then we talked about actual birth with the way in the manger and your participation. We're going to conclude today with we three kings as we think about those that came to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Jeff knows this, if any of you heard it, it's kind of a, an irony in some sort. Was there three? Probably not. Were there kings? No. Were they three born? No. Uh, so we got three things wrong in the title. Why do we say three? Basically because there are three kings, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But we even tried to say that these are their names, but we don't have any evidence of that. Uh, were they kings? No. They were actually probably magi. They were individuals probably from the Middle East of some sort. That were there, they maybe even had some tie ins back to the time of Daniel that were there to say they're signing from the heavens, something significant has been done. Let's come and see what this, what this is. And then, as far as uh, from the Orient, and you think that they were from the Middle East in some form, but these were actually just wise individuals, or sometimes people think that they were individuals that saw the signs in the heavens. So, as we play this last song, remind yourself the fact that there are individuals who came from Mars, probably took six months at least to a year to actually get to the place where Jesus actually was the light at that moment. And we hope that you've enjoyed this time together as we celebrate, and we'll conclude with We Three Kings. <coughs> Spirit. 